today I'll be beating the brand new Pokemon Scarlet using only shiny Pokemon. Not only that, I'll be teaching you, the viewer, in this video the methods I use to get a full shiny team before the first badge. Before that though, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe because this is our biggest video yet, with the run ending in us hunting over 10 shinies, so you won't want to miss it. Let's begin. What is that? Our adventure has only just started but we already have a problem. These little fellas here are all shiny locked. So no resetting for that shiny starter, but don't worry, I wanted to give you the full Gen 9 experience, so I do have a fix for it, but before then we're going to need a partner. So I begin the run by using a shiny method called the town method. This method is easy, you just check the area for a shiny Pokemon, and if it doesn't appear, you run into a town to reset the spawns. Easy as that, and with this method we get our first shiny in just 6 minutes. <gasps> No way! Dude! <laughs> Let's freaking go, dude. Oh my god. We name our little guy Jolin, and before we continue, I do grind for a while to level 9, so Jolin evolves. And my god, the shiny is actually adorable in this game. I swear it didn't look this good in X and Y. With our newly evolved Jolin, we are now brave enough to check out the mysterious noise. And it turns out to be a dinosaur looking creature who we promptly feed our sandwich, like a normal person would. After a grueling cave mission, we then meet up with this Pokemon's quote unquote trainer and the real main character of this game, Arvin. He challenges us to a battle to see who's worthy of Coridon, but his little squirrel causes zero problems as Jolin slowly but surely takes it out with Tackle. With that out of the way, we travel through our first real route where Jolin evolves into his final form. And man, I've been missing out on this shiny. It's actually so sick. With trading now available, we head over to my other save where we'll be using the Masuda method to hunt for our starter. The Masuda method is again another easy shiny method. All you have to do is breed two Pokemon of different languages. For example, my male Rookity was Japanese, while my Quaxley was English. This gives us a 1 in 683 odds of finding a shiny. And in just 8 eggs, this happens. Are you serious? Oh. We then trade our shiny starter over, allowing us to bypass the shiny lock and get that Gen 9 shiny experience. And now we did have two shinies in hand, both very capable of taking on the first gym. But I wanted another Gen 9 shiny. Little did I know how rough, yet rewarding that journey would be. After getting our three storylines from the academy, we're off to our first stop, the bug gym. But once I got there, I had the itch to hunt for a small of, using the town method and we find a funky looking group of birds. And look, I can't be too upset because our luck has been straight up illegal so far, but I really wanted another Gen 9 shiny, so I wanted to show them off to you guys. And in particular, I really wanted a shiny Pormy. So I head back to our hometown, ready to hunt, and honestly, I'm both cursed and blessed. I'll let the clip speak for itself. Oh. Are you serious? This isn't the one I want. Oh, God damn it, dude. <laughs> At this point, I was addicted and angry, which is a bad combination. And that's when a Lechonk outbreak appeared right next to a town. So we combine both the town reset and the outbreak's mass numbers to easily find a pink boy. Oh my god. With Harry on the team, we finally have another Gen 9 shiny. But again, I was a bit addicted and decided I refused to continue without my shiny Pormy. And just for some information, between the Lechunk hunt and the Hoppip hunt, there had been about two hours that had passed. That whole two hours, I was shiny hunting for Pormy. For this hunt, we'll be using the outbreak method, which is simple enough. Once an outbreak spawns, all you gotta do is kill 60 of them. You can use the auto battle for this, by the way, so it goes by pretty quickly. Once you've killed 60 of them, you'll get a message saying the horde is definitely getting lower. 
And bam, you've got a 1 out of 1,326 chance of finding a shiny. After this, you can reset the spawns by setting up a picnic, or just by walking away from the horde. And after two hours of doing this method, we finally find. Is that it? Wait. Oh, did we finally get it? Oh, that's it, that's it, that's it. Oh, I spent... Oh. Look, I can't complain because my shiny luck has been so good tonight. But it's here. No, stop, stop, stop. What the fuck? Is... No, what the? Pick one. We did it. Oh, I've been farming this outbreak for so long. Let's go. After eight straight hours of shiny hunting, it was time to take on the first gym. And now we did have three shiny flying types, but I wanted to use Quaxley because I just wanted to show off our shiny starter. Quaxley uses work up twice to get up to a plus two attack, and then we terrestrialize into a water type, boosting our water type moves even further. We take out her lead Nimble with an Aqua Jet, her Tarantula with a wing attack, and this leaves her ace Teddy Ursa, who changes into a bug type, allowing it to land a pretty nasty stab fury cutter, which does actually almost take Quaxley out, as our wing attack falls short of the KO. But with a boosted Aqua Jet, we're able to finish it off, winning the battle. We are awarded with more than just the badge though, as Jonathan and who I'll be calling Quaxwell both evolve into their second stages. And you'll be proud of me chat, I didn't shiny hunt, instead I head straight to the second gym, where we take on the grass gym leader, who I won't even begin to try pronouncing. He leads with a Patelli, who barely lives a wing attack, and puts up Jonathan to sleep, but we do wake up after one turn, and finish it off. Smaller is next, but it can't survive a wing attack, leaving him with his pseudo wudo. Now here, I terrestrialize into a normal type to dodge the potential rock throw, and our wing attack is sadly looking like a two shot with a crit. He then hits us with a Trailblaze, boosting his speed and making my terror useless. Thankfully though, we outspeed the next turn and crit again, so I guess my shiny luck isn't the only thing that's illegal this run, as we earn our second badge. Before we move on, Potato does evolve into Poor Moore, and then later evolves into Poor Mort, and it's just... so good. So, so good. And with a nice upgrade to the team, it's time to take on our first Titan Cloth, but this battle was honestly super easy as Quaxwell kind of just one shots it twice. Remember back in the day when they were showing us limited trailers of these games and there was that one that captured our hearts and that was the announcement of a new Wooper form. Look at this thing it's so goddamn cute. So of course I buckled down changed some dates until we found a Wooper outbreak and after abusing this poor population of Woopers for about three hours we find the mystical beautiful Taldean Wooper. Oh! Shiny Wooper? Let's go! Oh my god. So we evolve Hoppet into Skip Bloom and then Harry into his final form. And actually, this shiny looks pretty good. And then finally, Dingle, the newest member of the team, evolves into his final form. And with a ground type on the team, this next gym should be easy. Should be a piece of cake. Right? I don't like where this is going. Stop! Stop! Dingle the legend does eventually take it out, but man, that was painful. And now we have to switch out, but Harry ends up finishing off the Terror Miss Magius with no issues at all. And now, of course, since I have no self-control, I go straight back to shiny hunting, where we catch another superstar of this gen. Oh! Is that shiny? <gasps> Let's go! Fuck yeah, bro. Let's go! This only took me about two hours, so I was pretty happy, and the lore behind its color is extremely funny. This little gremlin here just has a hate boner for Corviknight, which is why we have to ride these silly dweebs, and its hammer is made out of the carcass of Corviknight. And the shiny, if you look, kind of resembles shiny Corviknight. So not only is this Pokemon cool, it's also a shiny hunter. With a new member of the Gen 9 shiny team, it's time to take on the next gym, who I thought was Larry, whose highest level was 36, but it's actually Kofu, so my guys were a little overleveled, so I decided to only bring Potato. 
And after terrestrializing, all we needed to do was press Spark three times, one-shotting all of his Pokemon. And now it's time for what I think is one of the hardest gym battles in the game. Larry, the hard-working, hard-hitting fifth gym leader utilizing normal types. Oh yeah, and Quaxwell evolved, and honestly, this looks a lot better in-game than when I was looking it up on Google. So with our new fighting type, we should have no troubles at all. Larry leads with the Sleepy Koala, who we take out with a low sweep. This brings in Dundun Sparse, who we use to get the plus one speed with Aqua Step, but this speed becomes irrelevant as we get paralyzed by Glare. I decided to terrestrialize to boost our power, as Hyper Drill brings us down to half HP as it lives the Aqua Step, and then we get fully paralyzed next turn, forcing us to tank another drill. This time we are left on just two HP. We do finally take it out though with an Aqua Jet, but this brings in his Star Raptor, who lowers our attack and then terrestrializes to finish us off with an Aerial Ace. We bring in Sunny, who gets thrashed by a facade considering she resists it, and returns with a extremely soft play rough. We trade attacks again, but on the third turn, its facade finishes Sunny off. So we bring in Potato, who lands a four hit arm thrust, finishing off the bird and stopping the sweep. With five gym badges claimed, we can evolve Sunny into Tinker Tong, defeat a Titan, and then we head straight to the sixth gym. Rhyme's gym does work a bit differently though, as it's all double battles. But honestly, her first two Pokemon were easily dealt with with a Gigatung Hammer each, as we bypass the recharge turns with Protect. She then brings in her Ace Toxicity, who terrestrializes and fires off a Discharge as we protect with Sunny. This Discharge was kind of nuts though, as it paralyzed both her Pokemon and my Jump Bluff, but it was holding a Cherry Berry, so it was able to cure itself. Thankfully, her Discharge does leave Sunny on 1 HP, allowing us to fire off one last Gigaton Hammer, as a Houndstone takes Sunny out with a Phantom Force. I then try to be cheeky on the next turn, thinking a Disarming Voice from Harry would take out Toxicity, as I heal up with Jump Bluff using Synthesis. But Toxicity lives and lands another Discharge, paralyzing Harry. Jump Bluff then disappoints me by missing the KO on the next turn with Mega Drain, as it's taken out with a Hex. And, you know, Harry just does zero damage again. But with Jump Bluff dead, we bring in Potato, who cleans up with a Wild Charge on Toxicity, and then another Wild Charge on the Houndstone, earning us our sixth badge. With a new badge, I reward myself with Dog. Normally, these outbreaks are taking like two hours. Of. That was so quick. We then evolve Gunner into Houndstone, and honestly, the dull colors in this evolution is a little bit disappointing, but hopefully the boost in power will make up for it. We test our new good boy against the seventh gym. Unfortunately, it is a poor matchup to start, as Tulip leads with a normal ghost type for Regarath, who we can't hit with our ghost type moves. And Gunner's crunch is doing just under 50%, meaning we'll have to land another two. As she then hits Gunner with her own crunch, Thankfully though, it looks like she's in the same boat as us, so after trading crunches, we do take it out, but Gunner is left on 5 HP. Tula brings in a Sparthra, so I switch into Jumpluff, who tanks a Shadow Ball like a beast. Jumpluff then tanks a Psychic as we pivot out with a U-turn, allowing us to bring in Sunny while doing decent chip. A Sparthra does outspeed, but it gets destroyed by a Gigatung Hammer in retaliation. Next is Gardevoir, so we use Protect to charge up our Hammer, and then one-shot it as well on the next turn. And then last up is Florigus, who is going to terrestrialize into a Psychic type, so Sunny hits it hard with a decent Brutal Swing, but then we Terra Steel and land a final smash of the Hammer to earn us our 7th badge. And I've gotta say, Sunny is so much fun to use, just watching this animation over and over again will never get old. We then head out to take on another Titan, and this time it's the Great Tusk Titan, which actually did cause us a bit of trouble, because goddamn this thing hits hard, and we weren't really able to one-shot it this time. But honestly, it was nothing Quaxwell can't handle with its water fighting type. And now, it's time to take on the final gym leader, Grusha, who leads off with the Frost Moth as we lead with Sunny. We take out the Chili Moth with our Hammer, bringing in her bear tick. So we protect, and then on the next turn, it's just another swing at the hammer. So Titan also gets protected on, as it barely lives the slam of the hammer next turn, but a brutal swing is able to finish it off. Then last up is her Altaria, who terrestrializes into an ice type, giving our hammer super effective power, allowing us to easily take it out as well. And man, that was a pretty easy final battle. Now with our final badge, it's time for our final hunt. And this just so happened to be the longest hunt of the run. This Pokemon 
took me 10 hours to find. 10 long and very annoying hours due to where it spawns. But despite the FPS and loading issues, despite a whole day passing me by, we find our last team member. We then evolve Nick with an ice stone and man, this shiny is gorgeous and well worth the hours. With a full team of gen 9 shinies, it's time to take on the elite four. We first though have to take a quick quiz, which I don't at all fail. <clears throat> After passing first time, we get to take on Rika and we feature Nick in his first battle. Nick starts off strong, terrestrializing, boosting his ice type moves, allowing him to two shot Wish Cash with Ice Spinner. Next is her camera up though, so I do bring in Caxwell, who is able to one shot it with an Aqua Step. Dolphin then enters the battle, and it does live the first one and retaliates with an Earthquake, but it isn't able to take us out or live a second Aqua Step, so that brings us to Doug Trio. But thanks to our speed boost, we easily take it out with another Aqua Step. Last is her ace, the powerful Clod Sire. So we bring Nick back out as it terrestrializes into a ground type and hits a decently hard earthquake. However, we're able to heal back up to full HP with Resto Chesto. And from here, an ice spinner is able to finish Clod Sire off, winning our first match. Our second match is against the intimidating steel type master Poppy, the goddamn three year old. She leads with Cobraja as I lead with Quaxwell, who works up as she uses Stealth Rocks. I try to use another work up, but uh, turns out it has play rough, which just obliterates Quaxwell. So that's um, that's a bit rough. I bring in Potato, who avenges Quaxwell with a close combat, and next is the Bell of Hell Bronzong. So I bring in Gunner, who tanks an Earthquake on the switch, but then we're able to land a hard Phantom Force as we shake off a Zen Headbutt, finishing it off the next turn with one last Phantom Force. Corviknight is next, so I decide to sack Gunner as we land a weak Phantom Force, and Corviknight takes us out with Brave Bird. I bring in Potato for free, and with the Terror Boost, Wild Charge is able to one-shot it. She then sends out Magnezone, but we should be able to wall it with our Bolt Absorb, so I go underground as she sets up Light Screen. We do get hit with a hefty try attack, but a quick attack on the next turn is able to finish it off. Poppy then brings in her Hammer of Hell, but since she's terrestrializing into a pure Steel type, our close combat is now super effective and able to one-shot it, winning the second round. Now it's time for our rematch against Larry, who is now a flying type trainer, which is perfect real estate for Nick, which is proven pretty quickly as our Ice Spinner one-shots his lead Tropius. He then brings out Staraptor, who is a bit scarier with it intimidating us, so I stay in and terrestrialize as it lands a big close combat, but we do live on 60 HP and take it out with an Ice Spinner. Altaria is out next, but I am able to use Resto Chesto again to get us to full HP, as Altaria then does little damage with Dragon Pulse, and then on the next turn, we're able to one-shot it with an Ice Spinner. Oricorio comes out, but quickly falls to yet another Ice Spinner, leaving Larry with his last Pokemon Flamingo who terrestrializes into a pure flying type and unfortunately it is able to live an ice spinner and takes Nick out with close combat. We are able to bring in Potato to finish it off though with a wild charge, but it's sad to see Nick miss out on the final KO for his clean sweep. And last up is the dragon member of the Elite Four, but man, it's almost not worth mentioning because after terrestrializing, Nick is just able to one shot his whole team with ice spinner. So yeah, Nick was definitely worth the 10 hours. And now it's champion time, but I did mess up thinking she started with King Gambit, leaving Quaxwell in trouble as we're up against the psychic type Esparthra. I terrestrialize into a water type to dodge the super effective damage as we hit an aqua step boosting our speed, but it also boosts her speed because she has an ability that copies our stat boost. So it outspeeds and finishes us off with a Luma Crash, and then I bring in Gunner who gets smacked by another Crash, but a Phantom Force is able to finish it off. She now finally brings in King Gambit, so I bring in Potato who tanks a cleave and is able to land a close combat for the one shot. Avalog is next, but it's able to live a close combat thanks to its monstrous defense stat as Earthquake is able to take Potato out. So I bring in Sunny to avenge her allies with a Gigaton Hammer, which is able to finish off the ice table. 
She then sends in her second psychic type, which is this weird fish thing, so I bring in Harry with the intention of sacking him. He is able to land Nice Chip with Headbutt, however Aqua Jet on the next turn takes him out. But this did let Gunner come in for free, and after barely living a liquidation, Phantom Force is able to finally kill the fish. Go Goat is the next one to come out, so I bring in good old Nick as the Goat sets up bulk up, and thanks to the defense boost, Ice Spinner isn't able to take it out, but she throws by setting up another bulk up, allowing our second Ice Spinner to finish it off. And now it's her last Pokemon, Gamora, who terrestrializes into a pure rock type, as Ice Spinner does very little damage, but she isn't able to take us out with a Sludge Wave, so I fire off one more Ice Spinner before getting taken out. And then we bring in the hero of the run, Sunny, who ends this final battle with a Gigaton Hammer, and now we are officially champions. Now that we are champions, we can face off against our rival at her full power, and honestly, since we are pretty underleveled, this battle was pretty tough. She leads with Lycanroc as we lead with Quaxwell, and I try to use a Muscle Band boosted Aqua Jet with Terrestrialization to one-shot it, but it lives in the red and sets up Stealth Rocks. Another Aqua Jet is able to finish it off though, but she sends out Poor Mod in an attempt to take out Quaxwell, but we bring in Harry the Sacrificial Bacon as he tanks a double shot and then is taken out with a close combat. Harry's sacrifice does allow Gunner to come in and after tanking an Ice Punch, Play Rough misses the KO. Thankfully though, all it can do is fire off another Ice Punch as Crunch finishes it off. The Dunsparce then comes in and shakes off a Play Rough and Gunner goes down to a Dragon Rush. I bring Quaxwell back out and set up a work up for really no reason, as Hyper Drill does chunk us out pretty hard, but Close Combat is able to one shot it the next turn. Orthworm is next and Close Combat is able to send it right back into its Pokeball, but Gudra is a bit tankier, so I switch Quaxwell out and bring in Sunny, who tanks it out with a combination of Gigaton Hammer and Play Rough. And this brings her down to her last and scariest Pokemon, Skeliurge. We stay in to sack Sunny as she terrestrializes, and after tanking our hammer like it was nothing, one shot Sunny with a Torch Song. This does also boost her special attack, and I bring in Nick, landing a very weak bounce, but we do actually paralyze it, but it does break through and takes out Nick. I then bring in Potato, who lands a dig, bringing Skeliurge into the red as she takes Potato out with an Earth Power. But now we're both down to our final Pokemon, so I bring in Quaxwell and with an Aqua Jet, we're able to win the battle. And with that, we've completed the Victory Road storyline using only shiny Pokemon. This run took me about 40 hours, which is actually pretty good, but it still was a lot of time, so I hope you guys did enjoy. And if you did, hit that like button. And if this video does well enough, I might do a part two with new shinies finishing the rest of the game. But until then, stay safe and see you all next time.